Well, this morning I've already told you what it is we're going to be looking at, but the text we're going to be looking at it from is Hebrews chapter 8. And we're going to be looking at verses 7 through 13. And again, this is a very familiar passage. This is actually a quote from the Old Testament for the most part. If you have the uh, NASB, whenever they quote the Old Testament, you'll see they put the quotes in all caps. So you know that's an Old Testament uh, quotation. Uh, this is actually a quote from Jeremiah 31 where it's speaking about the, the, the new covenant the Lord was going to make with his people uh, because really, essentially, the old covenant will be fulfilled when the Lord Jesus Christ comes and fulfills it. But what we want to see, uh, particularly this morning, is what it is the new covenant was supposed to do. Uh, why it is the Lord was replacing the Old Covenant with the New Covenant, what it is that Jesus has brought about from another perspective. Uh, we've talked about, you know, the, the work Jesus did, the bringing of the Holy Spirit, but here we see it from a slightly different perspective, spoken in Old Covenant terms. Uh, and again, the end result, though, of this gracious work of God is going to be a transformed life. So let's read beginning in verse 7 from Hebrews chapter 8. The author to the Hebrews writes, For if that first covenant, and by the way, that first covenant he's referring to here is the Mosaic covenant, not the Abrahamic covenant, not the other covenants mentioned in Scripture. It's referring specifically to the Mosaic covenant. If that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second for finding fault with them, he says, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother saying, know the Lord, for all will know me from the least to the greatest of them, for I will be merciful to their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. When he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. But whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. Well, may the Lord bless uh, his word to our hearing this morning. By the way, I'm going to do a bit of review this morning. And I know the tendency will be, since I'm reviewing, we'll just kind of tune all that out and we'll just wait till you get to the new stuff. But I really would encourage you to pay attention to the review because this is really what we're going to be looking at this evening, what we looked at last week and what we don't want to misunderstand, and that is how we are justified. Now, last week, as I already mentioned, we were looking at that truth that the church is actually built on. This is non-negotiable. This, if you have this, you have a church. If you don't have this, you don't have a church because you need this for salvation. And that is that justification is by grace through faith alone. Now remember, justification is God's declaration that we are righteous. It is that definitive moment in the court of heaven when we move from being guilty to innocent, when we actually move from that certainty of eternal horror that we would have to have faced in hell for our sins into God's family and the certainty of eternal blessedness in heaven. It is God's declaration that we are just. Now, we saw that God does not make that declaration based upon any good thing that we've done, but because of what Jesus has done, because of his obedience, because of his death. This is all because of the free gift of God's grace that he has given to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, think about this just by way of illustration. 
a gift, which is what justification is, a gift, wouldn't be a gift if you had to pay for it or if you had to work for it. If your employer took your paycheck and he wrapped it up in a gift box and he gave it to you at Christmas, <laughs> would you thank him for that? Would you look at it and, and say, thank you for that gift? No, you wouldn't do that because it's something that you earned. It's not a gift. It's your wage. There's a big difference. In the same way, if we had to work for our justification, God would not call it grace. He could not call it grace because works, earning something, is just the opposite of grace, which is a free gift. Remember what Paul writes in Romans 4, verse 4. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one, of course, who doesn't work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. And Paul goes on to say in Romans 11, verse 6, But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. Works, the principle of works, the, the, the idea that I earned it, destroys the idea of grace, which is something freely given at no cost. It is a gift. Grace is free. Now, at least it is to us. We do need to remember and never forget that it cost God dearly. It cost him the life of his own dear son. That's what the Lord's table reminds us of every single Lord's day. But that it might be of his free grace is also why it must be received by faith alone. Now, I've already mentioned this this morning, but I'm going to mention it again. Faith is not a work that we do that earns justification. When Paul says in Romans 4, verse 3, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, he did not mean that God counted his act of believing as that which justified him. Abraham, you believe that was a good thing, that was a good work you did, I'm going to declare you to be righteous because of the righteousness of that one act. That's not what God was saying. What he meant was that Abraham, by faith, was looking forward to the fulfillment of God's promise in the Lord Jesus Christ. And looking to the fulfillment of that promise, looking to the Messiah, by faith, he received his righteousness and he was counted just. You know, there was a view in, in the church, I didn't mention this last week, that was called neo Nomianism. There's always these fancy terms for these things, but it essentially means new law-ism that was actually championed by Richard Baxter. Now, Richard Baxter was a great uh, Puritan. We have his practical writings uh, in, in the library, and, and you'll certainly benefit by uh, reading those. But the one thing that is, is virtually never reprinted are his theological works because of mistakes that he made like this, okay? He taught that since we cannot keep God's Ten Commandments in order to justify ourselves, God made a new law in the gospel. And the new law is simply repent and believe. Everybody can do it, and if you will just do it, God will declare you to be righteous. Well, what's the problem with that? It turns faith into a work by which we are saved. And again, if that were true, justification would be by works. But faith is really just the opposite of works. It's looking away from our works, from everything that we have done to what Jesus has done. It's receiving Him as our Lord and as our Savior. It's relying on Him to fulfill what He said He would do to give us eternal life so that we would never perish. But now this morning we want to see that faith, saving faith, is also more than this. This morning we're going to look at the second part of the equation. Remember the reformers pressed the truth that we've just looked at, that we are saved by grace through faith alone. But we need to remember the reformers were just as insistent that the faith that saves us is never alone, but is always accompanied by good works. 
Now, we know that Jesus Christ came into the world for several reasons. We know that he came to fulfill prophecy, to prove God's word is true, to prove that he was the one who spoke it. He came into this world to glorify his Father by repairing the dishonor that we had done to him through our sins. Jesus made it possible for the Father to be just and yet to justify the ungodly. And he did it by providing perfect obedience and a payment for sin. Jesus also came to remove the curse from the creation. We know that one day all things are going to be made new again. The new heavens and the new earth are coming because of what Jesus Christ has done. But two of the reasons why Jesus came specifically had to do with us. When Jesus paid that debt on the cross, when he gave himself as an offering for our sin and he obeyed in our place, that is what brought about our justification. So he came to obey and die in order to justify us if we will only trust in him. But on the cross he did something else and this is what we need to pay attention to this morning. He freed us from our slavery to sin and gave us the power to obey. Listen to what Paul writes in Romans chapter 6 verses 3 and 4. And by the way, when he's talking here about baptism, he's not talking about water baptism. That's just a symbol of this baptism which actually brings this about. This is spirit baptism. And spirit baptism, by that I don't mean a second blessing where you begin to speak in tongues. But I'm talking about that act of the Holy Spirit where he puts you in the Lord Jesus Christ, where he connects you to Jesus Christ, where, as Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless you are born again by the Holy Spirit, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. That's the baptism that Paul is talking about here. This is what he says. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Basically, Paul is saying here that when we were connected to the Lord Jesus Christ, okay, we died with him. When he died, we died. And when he was raised, we were raised again to life, but now to live a new kind of life, to live a life of righteousness. Let me just say one more note here about baptism to show you that if baptism, water baptism, some people believe water baptism will actually do this for you, okay? I can think of a couple of churches offhand that believe this, but that's a grave error. If baptism could do this, then what we should be doing is going out and baptizing, Right? We should just baptize everybody we find in order to give them this grace. But you know what? Paul says something very interesting in 1 Corinthians when he's talking about how the people in Corinth were boasting, I was baptized by Apollos, I was baptized by uh, you know, Cephas, and, and so forth. Paul says, I thank God that I didn't baptize any of you because Jesus didn't send me to baptize. He sent me to preach the gospel. Now, if baptism could do this, could Paul say that? No, he couldn't. So this is not talking about water baptism. This is talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. For by one Spirit, he says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, you were all baptized into one body. Okay? This is spirit baptism. That's the only baptism that can actually bring this about. And that is the baptism by which the Lord actually saves us. So remember to keep that in mind. So the gospel is about what Jesus Christ did to justify us and to make us right with God, but it's also about what he did to transform our lives. You know, again, we were baptized into his death. We were raised again to newness of life. It's about what Jesus did so that we might become what he originally made us to be, and he originally made us to be like Jesus. That's what Adam was like until he sinned against the Lord and fell away from God. So the point here is we're not justified by doing good works, but we're also not saved without doing these works. If we have a true faith, we will be transformed from the inside out. We will do good works. That is the blessing of the new covenant. So now let's look at our passage. First of all, let's look at the problem with the old covenant the author to the Hebrews is addressing. Our passage this morning shows us one of the main differences between the Old Covenant and the New with respect to obedience. 
Now let me just say that if you're following along with our reading the Bible together, then you've just read the book of Hebrews and you've noticed as you've read that the author in that book sets out to show throughout the entire book how Jesus and the new covenant that he brings is better than the old in every way, right? Jesus is a better mediator, better than the angels, better than Moses. Jesus is the son who, whose house is, you know, God's house belongs to him, whereas the angels and Moses are basically servants in the house. Jesus is the one who brings us into a better rest than Joshua. Joshua brought the people of God into the land of Palestine, which was a picture of the rest of God. But Jesus, through his work, brings us into the true rest, which is heaven. Uh, the author to the Hebrews says he is also a better priest who makes a better sacrifice, and by that better sacrifice has established a better covenant. Now, the new covenant is better because it takes care of a problem that the old covenant could not take care of. Now, let's, let's read again verses 7 through 9 of our text. The author to the Hebrews says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. For finding fault with them, he says, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. By the way, let me just make another note here so we don't get hung up. Yes, this covenant is made with Israel and Judah. Yes, this is, you know, the, the covenant God meant for God's people, but they're the ones who rejected it and God turned to the Gentiles and we're the ones that are getting in on it because of their rejection. Okay, this is talking about what's going on now. This is not talking about something God has set aside with some other plan B, just for those of you who might be aware of that particular issue. So, yes, he's making it with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. Now, I want you to notice what the Lord is saying here and what he's not saying. First of all, he's not saying that there was anything wrong with the covenant itself. There was nothing wrong with it. It did exactly what God wanted it to do. It's just that what he wanted to do was to show his people that they needed Jesus. If, if we had time to look at this, we'd see that the Mosaic Covenant was actually added to the Abrahamic Covenant, and it was added in order to show them how they needed the promised seed of Abraham, how they needed to trust in Jesus. The Mosaic Covenant was never given to them in order to fix the problem or to save them, but it was rather given to them to point them to who could fix the problem. And that's what we read in Galatians 3, verses 23 through 24. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. The whole reason for the Mosaic economy was to drive them to the promised seed of Abraham who would justify them by faith so they might be saved even like Abraham who looked ahead and saw the Messiah and believed and he, it was reckoned to him as righteousness. So he gave it to them to show them that they had a problem. They were the ones with the problem. I want you to notice again what the author to the Hebrews says in verse 8. He says, for finding fault, not with the covenant, you would almost expect him to say that, but finding fault with them, he says, he's going to make a new covenant. And then in verse 9, for they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. The problem was with them. The problem was not with the covenant. Basically, this covenant showed them that they had the same problem that we have, and that is that we don't obey. We don't have the power to obey. Remember, Adam's sin in the garden killed us. He forfeited the Spirit who gives us the ability to obey. He did that not only for himself, but also for us. And of course, with the loss of the Spirit, any desire that we would have had actually to obey and submit to the Lord. That's why Paul writes in Ephesians 2.1, 
and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Adam's sin did not just wound us, didn't just weaken us, it killed us. We were spiritually dead. And in that condition, we could not do anything good. And the reason was because we didn't want to. Being spiritually dead, we hated God. Listen to what Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 7 and 8. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. This is the reason why they didn't continue in the covenant. This is why he found fault with them. This is why God says, I did not care for them. The problem with the old covenant was the only thing. It's not really a problem. It's just something that it never had the ability to do was that it could not change the heart. It could not change this situation. It couldn't change our situation. It could change theirs. But again, this is not why God gave it. God gave it actually to show them that they were condemned and needed a Savior. As John Bunyan pictures it, I think, so well in Pilgrim's Progress, I love this illustration, when he has Moses pummeling poor faithful as he's trying to climb uh, the hill of difficulty. All Moses can do is strike him to the ground and destroy him because he doesn't know how to show mercy. Now, again, that's not what Moses is like, but that's what the Old Covenant does. It continually strikes you down. It condemns you. The letter, Paul says, in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, kills. That's all the letter can do. These letters engraved in stone, all they can do is condemn you. They cannot change your heart they cannot give you the power to obey. All they can do is tell you what's required and they can show you you don't have what's required and so you're under the sentence of death. As I've said, it wasn't given to save them, but it was given to drive them to the one who could, to something better. And that brings us to the next point. What the old covenant couldn't do, the first covenant, the Mosaic covenant, Jesus did in the new covenant. Adam lost the spirit for all of us. But Jesus brings him back. Now the Lord told his people that this is exactly what he was intending to do through the prophet Ezekiel when he was ministering to the exiles in Babylon. Again, it wasn't that long ago he went through the book of Ezekiel and we saw that he lived during the, you know, one of the deportations. He was one of the folks from Judah who went into Babylon and was ministering to the exiles in Babylon. Well, the Lord said through Ezekiel, actually he told him and through him, the people of God, that he was going to send his spirit to give them the power to obey. He was talking about the new covenant. He says in Ezekiel 36, verses 24 through 27, For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. In other words, I'm going to bring the people of God who are dispersed, the Jews, I'm going to bring them back into the land. And he did that before Jesus came. Remember, they rebuilt their temple and, all, and they rebuilt the city. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. See, the Lord here is promising his spirit who's going to reverse this whole situation, reverse what Adam did to us. Spirit's going to come back, going to give us the power to do what the Lord calls us to do, which we couldn't do apart from the spirit of God. Remember, the spirit is the one who makes all the difference in the world. He's the difference between one who's dead and one who is alive. The Spirit is the one who quickens to life. Jesus says in John 6:63, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Uh, Jesus says it's the Spirit who opens our eyes to see the beauty of the kingdom, the reality and the beauty of the kingdom of God so that, of course, we might come into it. Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3, 3, 
Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. The Spirit is the one whom the Father sends to draw us to Jesus so that we might believe and be justified. Jesus says in John 6, no one can come to me. Nobody has the ability to come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and he does that through the Holy Spirit, and I will raise him up on the last day. But the Spirit of God is also the one, as we've just read, who gives us the power to obey God's law. And he does that by working love in us. The fruit of the Spirit is love, and it's love for holy things. Paul writes in Galatians 5, 6, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. The kind of faith that God gives is a faith that works by love, by the Holy Spirit whose fruit is love. And that's really what the author to the Hebrews goes on to tell us in the second part of our passage. The law written on stone could not give us the power to obey God's law, but the Spirit can give us that power and does give us that power by writing the law on our hearts. We read in verse 10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, I want you to notice that this work of the Holy Spirit not only brings us to Jesus so that we might be justified, but it also transforms our lives. And here is where the works actually come in. We don't work to, to earn our justification, but we work now because we want to do what the Lord actually calls us to do. We want to do these things because the Spirit of God has changed the way we look at the law. We used to hate the law, but now we love it because we see in it everything that is good. And again, let me remind you what, what the law actually is. It, is. it is really the definition of how we are to love God and how we are to love man. There is nothing you know, objectionable in it if you love righteousness, if you love God, it is the definition of love. Well, we used to hate that. We used to hate love. We loved hate. But now we love love, and that makes us want to do what God actually commands us. We are justified by faith alone, by grace through faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. Works are necessary. Works must be present in our lives because that is the work the Spirit does in the new covenant. He writes the laws on our hearts. He gives us a love for it. By the way, you know it's not on the, the beating organ in your chest. He writes it in your affections. That's what heart means. It's in your soul. It's in your spiritual nature. He gives you love for the law. Now again, let me remind you what Paul told us earlier, that after telling us that God, when we were dead, raised us to life, he goes on to tell us why he raised us to life in Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. How can we do those good works? The law of God is written on our hearts. He writes to Titus in Titus 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Notice, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous, for good deeds. Now again, works don't save us. They can't save us. But if we don't have works, if our life is not radically changed, and what I mean by radical is from the heart, you know, the, from the very core, the very center of our being, from the inside, as Jesus told the Pharisees, if our life isn't changed from the inside, if we're not becoming more like Jesus, Paul is telling us, as well as Jesus, we have not yet come to know him. 
Again, James writes this in James 2, verse 26. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. If your faith does not produce works, you have a dead faith, you do not have a saving faith. You cannot know the Lord if that's the case. Now again, we do need to put a few modifications in here. The Lord is not telling us that if we're not immediately perfect, that we're not saved. He's not telling us that if we're not going full force and full power all the time, zealous all the time, that we're still in danger of hell, although we should be seeking to be zealous and hot for him all the time. Remember the warning in the book of Revelation 3, verse 15. I would that you be you know, hot or cold, but not lukewarm. And if you're lukewarm, if you're still divided between the Lord and the world, the Lord says, you make me sick. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. I don't think any of us want to fall in that category. So be cold, don't love the Lord, or be hot, love the Lord. That's what you, and of course, don't be cold, be hot. Be zealous. But again, that rises and falls according to, again, circumstances and how we're spending time with the Lord, how not, whether we're fighting against sin and so forth. There will be ups and there will be downs. He's not telling us that if we're not absolutely mature Christians out of the gate, knowing the absolute distinction between good and evil, that we're not Christians. We need time to grow. But, but he is telling us this, that if we belong to Jesus Christ, we will be becoming like Jesus Christ. We'll be growing into his image, and we'll want to grow into his image. We'll be praying that God will make us more like him. We'll be reading the Bible, learning what He is like, trying to do what is pleasing to Him, trying to, to kill those things in our lives that we know that He hates and trying to put on the Lord Jesus. And we will do that knowing that He will be with us each step of the way to help us. And we can't do this apart from Him. He has become for us not only the source of forgiveness, but He's also become for us the source of spiritual strength and power. He will be with us to help us to grow and to mature more into His image. And we will also know, though we will often need to be reminded, as we've already seen, that even though we are going to be working like this, that our justification does not depend on those works. It depends on the grace of God alone. We will lapse from time to time, we'll forget, and sometimes we'll find ourselves getting caught up into thinking, oh, if I trail off of my works, I'm going to end up in hell. But the Lord will bring us back to this truth. We're saved by the grace of Christ alone. The good works are the evidence. We may lose something of our assurance when our works trail off, but we will not lose our justification. We will not lose our salvation. So as we prepare to come to the table this morning, let's just take a step back and take a good look at ourselves in light of what we just looked at to see if the Spirit of God is actually doing this work in us, if the evidence is there, if we're really growing into Jesus' image. If it is there, we do need to thank the Lord because it's purely of His mercy, but God in His mercy when we were dead made us alive. That's something God did. We need to thank Him for that. But we also, as we come to the table, need to ask Him to strengthen that grace in us even more. Even as we prayed in that hymn we, we sang, hymn 335, Gracious Spirit, dwell with me. As we come to the table, we need to look to the Lord and ask Him to give us more of His Holy Spirit. But as you look at yourself, if you don't see this work of the Holy Spirit, if you don't see yourself becoming more like Jesus Christ, if you're not doing the things that are consistent with, with this new birth, then don't come to the table. Remember the warning in Scripture says, don't come to the table because you're going to eat and drink judgment to yourselves. But instead, go to the Lord Jesus. Look to Him. Ask Him for His mercy. Ask Him for His grace so that you might trust in Him, that you might be justified by His works and be transformed by His Holy Spirit. Again, may the Lord apply His Word to each of us as we need to hear it. Let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to, to help us do that.